Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. In the last few episodes, we've been working up to a better understanding of transistors, as we've tried to explain the strange gothic arch waveform that we got when we tried to build a high-gain amplifier. We built a test rig that lets us measure the current through a diode or transistor as a function of a voltage at one of its terminals. We ran the test rig on a bunch of diodes and learned about the Shockley diode equation, which describes diode behavior well enough that it's what most circuit simulators use. Now at last, let's run our test rig on a transistor. The mathematical formulation that we'll use is called the Ebers-Mole model. This model and slightly more sophisticated variants are staples of electronic simulation programs. With it, we can deal with nearly all the transistor circuits that I intend to build on this channel. You might wonder why I devoted the whole last episode to diodes. Well, remember that at its heart, a transistor is just two diodes. What the Ebers-Mole model does is to augment those two diodes with current sources to reflect the current amplification of the transistor. The full Ebers-Mole model is a little complicated, but most of the complexity deals with leakage currents and operating conditions that have names like reverse active conduction and avalanche breakdown. We usually spend time in our designs trying to avoid these. If we confine ourselves to the cutoff region, the conventional active region, and saturation, the model reduces to the same equation as for diodes. Just as with diodes, there's a minus one in the equation that we can virtually always ignore. In fact, the transistor equation is simpler. There's no ideality factor in the exponent. I won't get into all the details, but if you run the algebra on the full-up Ebers-Mole model, you'll find that the current sources reduce the ideality factor to well less than 1.01 for a typical transistor. Combine this equation of the collector with the diode equation of the base emitter junction, and we're done. We've already verified that the base emitter junction follows the diode equation. Now let's take a quick look and make sure that the collector current follows the Ebers-Mole model. We're actually measuring the emitter current, but with the transistor's beta over 200, that's effectively the same thing. We'll continue to abuse the same 2N4401 transistor that we've been working with, put it on our test rig, and subject it to various collector voltages. We'll tabulate the best fit for the saturation current. The last test will make the collector voltage as small as possible by tying the base and collector together. So here we go. 12 volts. Five volts. Three point three volts. And with the collector shorted to the base. The saturation currents are all within a factor of two of one another. The poor fit doesn't surprise me all that much, considering how poor the data off the breadboard turned out to be. I'm pretty convinced that the model works. This is the point where I'm supposed to say that now you know the big secret of transistors. They're actually voltage-controlled current sources. And I'm supposed to offer our experiments as evidence of the fact. But designers seem to lead useful lives even when they consider only the simple current-controlled model. And commenters on YouTube videos get pretty agitated about it. Why does the simple model work so well so much of the time? Well, let's look at the system of equations. Shockley's diode equation says that the base current is approximately exponential in the base voltage. Equivalently, the base voltage is approximately logarithmic in the base current. And the Ebers-Mole equation says that the collector current is approximately exponential in the base voltage. 
and the exponential of a log is a linear function. Okay, I can see you're not convinced. There are non-ideality factors and the like floating around. You're going to make me do the algebra, aren't you? Well, all right. Shockley's diode law tells us what base current will be induced by a given base voltage. But it's equally valid to say that a given base current induces a voltage between base and emitter. The Ebers-Mole equation tells us the collector current that the transistor will pass at a given base voltage. We can substitute in the base voltage that the diode law gave us. And the thermal voltage cancels out. We can also simplify the exponential. Note that eta is close to 1. For the transistor we've been playing with, it's about 1.3. That means that the equation will be nearly linear. Okay, I can see you're still not convinced. Let me plug in the numbers we've just measured for our transistor and plot collector current against base current. You see? Almost a straight line. And if you look at the slope of the line, it's pretty nearly the value we measured for beta way back in episode 4 of this series. It's only where the transistor is close to cutoff that the linear relation breaks down. Break it up, you guys! You can look at it as either voltage controlled or current controlled. It depends on what you need. But if using beta works so well, what went wrong with our attempt at a high gain amplifier? We understand why the negative peaks clipped, but what's with the rest of the distortion? Well, if you recall, we still had an unsolved mystery. We weren't able to calculate the AC input impedance of the circuit. Our formula said that the impedance looking into the base should be the transistor's beta times the impedance looking out of the emitter. But at signal frequencies, the emitter capacitor looks like a short circuit. The impedance looking into the base ought also to be a short circuit. Obviously, that's not what we're seeing, but now we can explain it. First, let's take a moment to look at the relation between base voltage and emitter current. If we turn it on its side, and look at the base voltage that's needed to induce a given collector current. It's easy enough to calculate. Take the Ebers-Mole equation and solve it for the base voltage. Now we can take the quiescent current and the corresponding voltage and look at what voltage change is needed to induce a small change in the current. We can get the slope of that line from some simple calculus. This is the amount of extra current that you'd get if you move the emitter voltage down a tiny bit. That's exactly what you'd see if there were a resistor in series with the emitter. The value of that resistor is the slope that we just computed. The room temperature value for small signals is easy to remember. 25 ohms divided by collector current in milliamps. Have the collector current from a milliamp to 500 microamps, and you'll double the effective resistance to 50 ohms. Double it to 2 milliamps, and you have the effective resistance to 12.5 ohms. Now we can look at the waveform that we got from the problem amplifier. Let's see what happens to the gain at various points in the cycle. When the input voltage is at its lowest, the transistor is nearly cut off. That makes the output voltage high. 11.2 volts is only 0.8 volts below the supply rail. The collector current is that 0.8 volts divided by the 6.2K collector resistor. The intrinsic emitter resistance is the 25 millivolt thermal voltage divided by that current. The gain will be the collector resistor divided by that intrinsic resistance. We can do the same calculation when the transistor is approaching saturation. The gain is more than 10 times higher at that end of the range. Of course, we can fill in the table for intermediate values as well. The values we get for gain seem to match the slope of the output. The curve is nearly flat near the peak and very steep near cutoff. With that much gain variation, no wonder it's so distorted. Near the designed quiescent point, the circuit gain is about 240. For tiny input signals, 
you might be able to get acceptable linearity, but we're going to see much better ways to get high gain. One more thing to watch out for is the low intrinsic resistance when the transistor is saturated. That will transform to a correspondingly low input impedance. For AC coupled circuits, this means you'll need a bigger coupling capacitor than you expect. In fact, for the earlier demo of this circuit, I chose a value that was too small. I fudged it by sneakily increasing the frequency of operation. And if you were simply to ground the emitter, rather than just grounding its AC signal path, then once the base emitter diode is conducting heavily, your bias point is ruined. Other circuits that look at the same input signal will also likely be affected. I shouldn't belabor this circuit too much more. Circuits with a nonlinear response like this are usually bad circuits. The way to avoid this nonlinearity with the common emitter amplifier is to put in an emitter resistor much larger than the intrinsic emitter resistance at the intended current. That will buy you linearity at the expense of gain, but we'll soon be seeing other ways to design high gain circuits. This has been a lot of discussion, and now we have a much better idea of how transistors work. We can work out how the non-constant diode drop between base and emitter varies with the base current, and how the collector current varies non-linearly with that diode drop. That lets us begin to understand how our transistors react to large signals. We also learned a trick for small signal analysis. We can think of a transistor as always having a tiny resistor in its emitter lead, whose value at room temperature is 25 millivolts divided by the collector current. These rules will give us the tools to unlock a whole menagerie of transistor circuits. Next time, I'll start working on one of them, the current mirror. Thanks for watching, and I hope you stay tuned for that. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!